My name is John Bell, and uh, I am the director of the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry. And we are here this evening at seven o'clock Eastern time <clears throat> for our last uh, puppet forum of the fall semester here at the University of Connecticut. And the title of this puppet forum is Engineering in Puppetry. Really interesting for us. And uh, I'm really happy that we have with us uh, this evening Basil Twist and Ed Weingart and Jason Lee, who are uh, introduced more formally in a second. I wanna thank our Ballard Institute Manager of Operations and Collections, Emily Wicks, for dealing with all of the tech stuff, the engineering stuff uh, going on uh, behind the scenes. So thank you, Emily. I uh, wanted to say that um, we do all sorts of online programming, uh, workshops and uh, forums like this. We're able to do some things live. Our museum is open in Stores, Connecticut and downtown stores on Saturdays, just Saturdays because of COVID from 10 to four uh, by appointment, uh, distanced viewing. We're also taking part in an outdoor winter welcome event next Saturday, uh, December 12th, uh, outdoor performances and shadow theater and giant puppet performance by our grad assistant, Felicia Cooper, and our undergraduate assistant, Elise Van Ness, who've been doing amazing work all summer and fall. We have two exhibitions up in the museum right now. Uh, uh, Shakespeare and, and Puppetry, curated by Dr. Youngmin Sung, and also, um, uh, oh gosh, now I'm blanking, on uh, uh, Paul, Paul Vincent Davis uh, and the Art of Puppet Theater, which is a wonderful exhibit uh, that opened just when COVID started. So we've been uh, hanging on to that because it's a beautiful exhibit of Paul Vincent Davis's work. So please come and check those out. I just wanted to let you know that opening on March 6th in the new year will be an exhibition also curated by Youngmin Song, Race, Ethnicity and Puppetry, representing the other, which is gonna look at our collections with, a, with an eye towards how puppetry has for, for almost forever been a way that people represent those who are not like themselves, which is a complicated kind of thing to do. So engineering and puppetry is, is super, uh, super exciting. Um, I, it took me a while to, um, to understand that in a way engineering is puppetry or puppetry is the performance of engineering in a way. We are happy that, um, this event is co-sponsored by the uh, School of Engineering at UConn and the uh, Kranicki Institute of Art and uh, Engineering. I didn't write down what uh, the definition, the exact title of the Kranicki Institute, but it's bringing together engineering and the arts. So that's super exciting for us. I'd like to introduce our three panelists for this evening, our three discussants. Uh, Basil Twist, uh, who's in London right now, and if you is uh, just finished his dinner, um, is a third generation puppeteer and native of San Francisco. His grandfather, Griff Williams, was a very famous marionette performer and band leader. Uh, Basil is the sole American to graduate from the Ecole Supérieure Nationale des Arts de la Marionnette in Charleville, Monsieur, France. And after that, he came to New York. Um, I was living in New York at the time and it was like, boom, uh, wonderful, wonderful new uh, energy and, and vision. Uh, his work has been spotlighted by the Jim Henson Festival uh, with the Ariadne show and then Symphony Fantastique about which we're gonna hear a little bit later and which uh, a film of which Basil has recently made and is gonna be available online. Uh, speaking of engineering, Symphony Fantastique Fantastique, a big show in a water tank. Uh, that revealed Twist to be a singular artist of unlimited imagination. Uh, he's directed, conceived and directed operas for Houston Grand Opera, um, 
uh, Sleeping Beauty by Raspighi and Hansel and Gretel by Humperdinck. And on Broadway, uh, puppet designs for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, Oh Hello, The Adams Family. And then I think Dear to the Heart of Puppeteers, uh, well, also puppetry for Pee Wee Herman's show, big favorite. But he's also collaborated with Lee Brewer and Mabu Mines, one of the very important puppet companies in downtown New York theater and received tons of awards like Obie's Drama Desk Awards, Unimo Awards, Bessie Awards, et cetera. He does the spider that comes down from the tower in the Greenwich Village Halloween Parade, an overall mensch. Um, he's been very generous with our company, Great Small Works, uh, performing with, uh, for events we've done. And uh, uh, MacArthur Guggenheim Award winner, Doris Duke Performing Artist Award. He, uh, one of his relatively recent shows, well, it's not relatively recent, uh, I think it's 2016, Sisters Follies Between Two Worlds was done at the Abrams Arts Center, which was started as the Neighborhood Playhouse, part of the Little Theater Movement. We'll be talking about that. So welcome, Basil, from London, hi. where you're doing a new project. Yes. Hi. Hi, John. I'm so glad to be with you because I always want to come and join you. And some a lot of times I can't. I know. I'm someplace else. And then when you said, oh, we're going to do it online, I said, oh, I can do that wherever I am. So right. anyway, later. In a way, it's been yeah. easier to get you to come to come here online from London yeah. than it has been to get you to come up from New York to Connecticut. Yeah. My colleague, Ed Weingart, is the associate professor, an associate professor of technical direction at the University of Connecticut. Hi, Ed where he's currently serving as the department head for the dramatic arts department, the interim head. So for which we're all very grateful <laughs> for Ted taking on this incredible weight or opportunity. He also works as the director of special projects for Creative Connors and works in the US and abroad as a flying director for the performing, performer flying company Vertigo. He's an ETCP certified rigger for theater and uh, I admit, I don't know exactly what these things mean. A CM, a certified hoist technicians, technician. In New York, he, uh, he did the flying direction for Sisters Follies, about which you're going to hear a lot. And the automation system design for Jordan Wolfson's colored sculpture, uh, which premiered at the David Werner Gallery and has been touring over Europe. He's worked as the head rigger and automation supervisor for the Calgary Stampede Grandstand Show in Alberta, Canada. And he's designed several stock automation products, um, which is actually super interesting, at Creative Connors, which are used in theaters across the country and abroad. Um, Ed holds a BFA in design technical theater and MFA in technical direction from UConn. So maybe you can see how we're starting to think about theater and technology and engineering. Uh, thirdly, Jason Lee is an assistant professor in residence at UConn's Department of Mechanical Engineering, where he teaches a variety of mechanical engineering courses. Hi, Jason. Two of the courses he teaches, he focuses on our uh, first year and senior design project-based courses. Uh, where he teaches prototype design, project management, design testing principles, and um, stuff like that. Um, I, his research focuses on computational heat transfer studies of manufacturing processes and characterization of polymer, nanocomposite, and nanofibers used for ablative and high strength applications. Um, <laughs> he's currently exploring areas in advanced manufacturing with a focus in aerospace and sports applications. I welcome all. I noticed thinking about Jason's work I, that he at a certain point was at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And that made me think for a while, I was a fellow at the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT. And that was super interesting because while I'm not technophobic, I'm not a super skilled engineer, of course. And I realized there, especially working with all these students who were inventing things and working above the M MIT, the model train society, which was fundamentally important for the development of programming back in the day. 
that combination of play, making model trains work or inventing this playful use of technology co now called hacking, like that culture of performance and play made me think, oh, that kind of play with objects is what we puppeteers do. And then I thought, well, in my own work, designing uh, uh, structural systems for giant puppets or just stringing marionettes or building hand puppets or whatever, it made me think, oh yeah, that's, we're sort of connected there. We're, what puppeteers do is a lot about making materials work and things move and getting things done through technology. So that's um, that was sort of my excitement in part about technology and performance and uh, technology and, and puppetry. What we wanna do is ask each of you, beginning with Basil and then Ed and then Jason to talk about your own perspectives on um, engineering in puppetry, which is a title that Ed had suggested brilliantly, how you're, about your work, how you think of puppetry and engineering, what your experiences with puppets and engineering have been. And uh, I think with, especially with Basil and Ed who co collaborated on Sisters Follies, um, how you work together from your perspective disciplines. And I'm thinking like, well, how are puppetry and engineering similar and how are they different? And do, you pers do your perspective change, do your perspectives change when you consider what you're doing from the standpoint of engineering or from the standpoint of puppetry? And then we want Ed, excuse me, Jason, who wasn't involved in this Sisters Follies collaboration, uh, we're depending on him to sort of bring everything together with his brilliant analyses of from his own perspective on uh, uh, what what puppetry and engineering might have in common. I'm no, being, pressure. <laughs> no pressure. I'm being a little bit tongue in cheek, but we thought we'd start um, with at, with Basil. And let me add, um, we're welcome. We welcome uh, audience comments in the chat column of the Facebook feed, um, and you know, when it's relevant, we definitely want to get to them. We want to, we'll include a uh, discussion and question and answer. So please feel free to comment or um, write, put in your questions and we'll, we'll try to get to them. So Basil, welcome. How are you? And what do you think? <laughs> um, I think this is a great subject. So uh, um, I, uh, so interesting fact. So you said in my um, in my do tout in my bio that uh, puppetry is in my family. Um, on it's actually on my mother's side. So my mother was a puppeteer when I was a kid, and then her, my maternal grandfather was a musician and a puppeteer. But actually, on my father's side and. Um, Basil Twist is my real name. So I'm Basil Twist the third. So Basil Twist Jr. and Basil Twist Sr. were engineers. Um, so uh, particularly my grandfather, uh, Basil Twist Sr. So um, he, he designed um, farm equipment. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then my, my father has been involved in um, designing sailboats and so um anyway so the the you know I was always artistic <laughs> as a kid uh and it seems like I gravitated towards that side of the family that was um that was a uh, puppeteer you know that had that the, that music and arts background but um but actually there is this engineering uh, gene in there too and it's it's the, the basils, uh, the three basils, my father and my grandfather were also engineers. And, um, and they actually both were key um, when I did, uh, when I made Symphony Fantastique, they both got really into it and involved in helping me um, design um, the tank that I used because Symphony Fantastique takes place in an, enor in an enormous aquarium. Um, so, uh, they both, 
you know, we <laughs> really were passionate about helping me make, first I had a 500 gallon tank um, and my father really helped me with that and some of his sailing buddies. And then when I made the bigger tank, my grandfather got really involved in that. Um, uh, I guess that might be a perfect moment to show a photo of uh, Symphony Fantastique, just so we understand, because I I'll probably refer to it a lot. Um, uh, th this is an image, this is the kind of imagery that happens in the show. So Symphony Fantastique is a, a, an abstract puppet show. So it's also kind of pushing the definition of puppetry. The, to me, this is a puppet that's, that is brought to life by puppeteers. And it's what brings it to life is that it's underwater. Um, and if we uh, look at the next picture, you can see uh, um, backstage how the puppeteers are gathered around the um, the aquarium um, to, uh, to to animate the objects that are in the water. Um, anyway, it took a lot of engineering to do this. Um, the water is extremely heavy, um, uh, so. Like I had no idea when I first imagined Symphony Fantastique, Symphony that piece of music has five movements, and I thought, oh, I'm gonna do one movement like this and one movement like that, and the third movement I'm gonna do underwater, and we'll just roll this big tank into place, and then we'll roll it away, and that was insane. That it was, you know, it weighed that tank weighed well over two tons, the 500 gallon tank. So I, and also the water was so cool that I did the whole show underwater. Um, I have a film of Symphony Fantastique that I just completed and that I'm actually just made available for streaming um, as a bit of a fundraiser for my company. And uh, I think we're gonna put the link on it, but maybe we could show the trailer for that film. It shows a little of how it works um, backstage. So as that clip sh shows, there was an aquarium. There were five puppeteers behind, above, and on the sides of the aquarium. And the audience was looking at one side of the aquarium uh, and they couldn't see the puppeteers working. And they just saw this fantastical imagery being created. Um, so, uh, so, um, Anyway, that 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 is a, a signature piece of mine, and I um, uh, it has informed a lot of other work that I've done in playing with abstraction and um, and and figurative stuff. But also just the like the challenge of the engineering of that. You know, every theater we go into, that tank is so heavy. We have to be aware of the floor. Are we going to bust through the floor? Um, how do we deal with the water in and out? What if when we first did the show, we were downstairs and we had to get the water out upstairs. So we had to pump it upstairs. It made it harder. Um, there were so many um, kind of engineering issues that came up around that show. Um, 
I, I just, I took a note for myself just as a kid, when I grew up in, in San Francisco, there was an amazing uh, science museum called the Exploratorium. That's one of the like original science museums, um, interactive science art museums that was hugely inspirational to me in a lot of my work. It had effects that were with smoke and with water and with light and, um, and it was my favorite exhibits were always things that demonstrated basic, basic physical principles with some sort of um, you know, structural element that in fact was delightful and almost seemed magical. And um, I think that informed a lot of my work. Th there's another piece also that I just want to share about too, which relates, I think specifically to engineering is um, this piece called the Rite of Spring uh, that I did um, in 2014. Um, so it's Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. It was kind of like Symphony Fantastique on a giant scale, but not underwater. Um, and so I used a lot of fabric and silk and air and smoke. Um, and maybe we can show uh, just the pictures of that. It was performed with a live orchestra. You can see the orchestra here. Um, and, uh, and there was a lot of silk in the show and the, the scale of the piece was, um, was huge for me. Um, but what was thrilling for me in particular was having the technology of, if we look at the next picture, you really see the scale that having the technology, the, the traditional technology of a theater, of a classical proscenium theater with a, with a fly space, with an orchestra pit, of course, but particularly the fly space and the line sets that moved and the offstage space, the backstage space. Frequently when I do a puppet show, I recreate that space myself. And here I was able to use that that theater technology, that engineering that's been in place for, <laughs> for years and years and years and repurpose it for, to really push it to its limits, to use every single line set, to use uh, any of the, a substage space, to use, you know, the, the traditional uh, maskings and tracking systems that are in any large theater and to use them as choreography, to use them to, puppeteer them to animate them and bring them to life. Um, and uh, anyway, that's another, I don't know, a kind of a key piece. And I, I just would say that a lot of times when I go into those situations where I'm working with theater technicians and I'm doing something kind of out of the box, I'm always um, nervous about it, that they're going to say, you can't do that. That's not allowed. Um, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, th th that's wrong. <laughs> and, um, and I frequently find that I just, this is one thing I think is interesting. When I do work with traditional theater technicians, sometimes I find that they over engineer things, that things are overbuilt sometimes for strength, for durability. And sometimes that affects the life of something that sometimes I, I prefer to work with something that is much more uh, uh, fluid and, uh, um, and uh, tender than the, the hard uh, steel beams and stuff. So that's always a tension between when I'm working in a traditional space is um, what I find is that's, or, or working with more traditional theater crafts people, sometimes things are over-engineered when I want something to be actually to have a shimmer of life in it. Um, I'm finding that right now in the project I'm working on here. And, um, and just to give a little bit of context about, uh, about uh, Sisters Follies before we launch into it more, Sisters Follies was a piece that I did at the Abrams Art Center, which is in Lower Manhattan. Um, it was celebrating the 100th anniversary of that theater, which was when it was originated, it was known as the Neighborhood Playhouse, um, created in, in 1915. And, um, and there is um, an enormous amount of history in that theater. And we created a show that was paying homage to the sisters who founded the theater, um, Alice and Irene Lewison. And anyone who works in that theater um, 
has commented that it seems like there are ghosts there. And so the idea was to summon the ghosts, to create the ghosts. And I had two live performers, not puppets, but two live performers, um, wonderful performers, Joey Arias and Julie Atlas Muse, who were to play respectively Alice and Irene Lewison as their selves who had created this theater, but also their current selves as ghosts in the theater. And I knew that the first image that I wanted in the show was that, and we did this show in October too, so it was a sort of spook fest, but the first image was that we slowly fade up and see these two figures floating in the air. And, um, and that theater, although it's a small theater, is an extraordinary theater because it has the traditional st not stage technology, fly space, line sets, an orchestra pit. And I wanted to make two people fly and actually really use my team of puppeteers to really make them fly, to do a fantastic flying effect of these two sisters who as sisters do, they quarrel and, um, and eventually they have a fight and there's some amazing uh, stagecraft that they do, they were flying. And that's how I got to work with Ed um, in creating that flying effect in that old theater. And I guess we'll talk more about that when we get to there. So anyway, that's kind of my, my beginning pitch about me. Wow, thanks Basil, that's really exciting and insightful. I appreciate learning about the, your, the, fa, fa, the twist side of the family of engineers. I was also thinking, you know, thinking about um, just to put a little historical note, I remember seeing Symphony Fantastique and thinking, oh, this is like an, a realization of what uh, Vasily Kandinsky talked about with his, I think, 1912 uh, uh, scenario, the yellow sound, which was all wow. about colors moving. like. In other words, there's this interesting history to that. Also with the, the Rite of Spring, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, which also first happened at a time of great artistic and theatrical innovation. Um, and, and I think of Sisters Follies and the Neighborhood Playhouse also as a place where in the 20s and 30s, a lot of innovative puppet and puppet related work by people like Tony Sarg um, or Thomas Wilfred who did work with color organs, that was also happening. So I just wanted to throw that in as a geeky reference and wanted to get to Ed, whose work you've mentioned um, and uh, in Sisters Follies and, and Ed's amazing work on the stage. Ed, how did, what's your connection to this engineering and puppetry? Well, thank you, John. Um, and uh, it's wonderful to see you again, Basil. It's been too long. Um, so my connection is, um, John alluded to it a little bit, but my, my normal job when I'm not being the interim department head for, for the drama department here at UConn is I'm the technical director in the theater department. And I've often, and this is what I teach in my technical direction program, that a technical director is more than anything an artist enabler. It's our job to figure out how to take the vision of artists like you just heard from Basil, his vision of, well, I just want this big thing of water on stage. A lot of times artists don't think about the, everything that goes on behind the scenes in order to make those things sort of happen. And so it need, they often need someone, not always, but often need someone to help figure out and solve some of those challenges. And that's kind of what I, that's what I've made a living doing. That's, my, that's what my job is, is I solve technical challenges for artists. Um, to enable them to for, uh, bring their visions to life and to create whatever it is in their crazy heads that they want to create. Um, and I don't, I don't have those sort of visions that um, really talented artists um, do, um, but what I do have is the ability to bring them to life. So I really enjoy doing that and I um, was very fortunate to be able to work with Basil on Sisters Follies. Um, but I'm gonna, I, before I get to Sisters Follies, I just want to talk a little bit about um, some of the other engineering puppetry things that I've done. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, I've been very, very fortunate um, to be here at the University of Connecticut. Um, I, I actually did do my graduate work here at UConn. And then when I went and worked professionally in the field, it was very strange because I'm very used to having 
um, a whole team of highly trained and knowledgeable puppeteers at my disposal. And, um, I always tell the story that when I started working um, at the Performance Network Theater in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, we were talking about doing a show that needed some shadow puppetry. Um, and to me, that was, oh, no problem. You know, we have the people who know how to do that. But I forgot that I didn't have those people anymore and I should have paid more attention so that I knew how to do that, but I didn't at the time. Um, so uh, for a long time, I, I longed to come back to UConn where we have this amazing puppetry program. Uh, and I was, um, I was able to do that finally, which uh, made me very, very happy. But so since I've been back at UConn uh, for the past six or seven years, um, I've had an opportunity to collaborate with a lot of graduate students uh, who are working on different projects and undergraduate students who are working on projects. Um, the most recent one, uh, which didn't actually end up coming to fruition, but uh, I was um, I was fortunate to be able to work with Will Smith and Rob Cutler on their project designing and creating the Audrey puppets for um, Little Shop of Horrors. And there was a lot of engineering that went into, especially the uh, the the third and fourth puppets, which are really quite large and have to um, be able to eat a human being, but be able to have life in motion. Like Basil was saying, you can't over design and over engineer something so much so that it doesn't have its own life anymore if you're trying to bring it to life um, via puppeteering. And so <clears throat> I've been really lucky to do a lot of uh, things like that uh, in my time at UConn and I continue to be able to work with um, both really talented and visionary undergraduates and graduate students at the university. Um, another show that I worked on um, more recently is uh, Jordan Wolfson's Colored Sculpture. So before I talk about that, uh, if you don't mind, Emily, could you play that quick little clip we have just so people know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Um, so <laughs> what you saw there was um, a little uh, brief snippet of Jordan Wolfson's Colored Sculpture Project, which uh, debuted um, in New York City at the David's Winter Gallery, uh, and it has since toured to uh, Arlen's France, and it's gone to the Netherlands. I think most recently it was at the Tate in London. Um, and it's basically a marionette puppet. It really is just a marionette puppet. But again, the artist came to um, the company that I do work for outside of the university, Creative Connors, which is a, an automation company. And they said, well, we have this, I, the artist has this idea and we need someone to create the mechanisms and the machinery to be able to make it happen. And he had a few very specific requirements um, that took quite a few months of engineering to figure out, <laughs> um, but it was a really enjoyable time. And so as you saw, um, the first requirement was that the chain that was going to go between the machines and the puppet are quite large. They're actually about an inch. Um, the, each link is a little over an inch big. It's actually um, anchor chain from 100 foot mega yachts is what the chain is actually designed for. And so we had to create a machine that would be able to move those chains. Um, so naturally, the first thing that my mind goes to, and Jason's going to talk about this kind of design process a little bit more uh, in a few minutes, but um trying to figure out how to go from well here's what the artist needs it has to be this gigantic chain and the first solution that i came up with is i found a chain that was about i think a quarter of an inch smaller <clears throat> that we could just buy the parts for we didn't have to manufacture them or engineer and make them from scratch and the artist that was that it wasn't going to work it had to be that size chain that to fulfill his vision so we had to go back and um basically make everything from scratch and make a machine that was able to move both very, very, very slowly, but also be able to drop the puppet at almost um, the speed of gravity, almost nine feet per second is the, the speed range that they wanted. So it was, it was really a unique and interesting engineering challenge because no machines like that exist in the world. There are chain hoists that do lifting with smaller chains very slowly. Um, and there are the anchor systems on mega yachts, which work completely differently. And we kind of had to mash those two things together and then create something that would be safe for the audience and safe for 
um, the creators to work around. <clears throat> so it was really a fascinating experience working on that project. And uh, I think that outcome was, um, it worked really, really well. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a bit of a, um, I, had, I like to say creepy. It's a little bit of a creepy thing if you, um, I'm sure if you can go and Google and see more of the show, uh, there are longer segments of it out there. But um, So that brings me to uh, Sisters Follies. So if you could put up um, the other PDF that I sent you, Emily. Um, so as Basil had mentioned, Sister Fall Sisters Follies was done in the Abrams Playhouse. And this is a section drawing of the Abrams Playhouse. Um, I've, for a moment, I'm deciding whether or not to explain what a section drawing is, but hopefully enough people know what it is that you can help each other out. Um, it's basically if you cut the theater in half and looked sideways at, at the theater. So um, the theater, we were celebrating the 100th anniversary of the theater indeed, and some of the rigging equipment was original to that 100 years. And anytime you're approaching an engineering challenge where you have human life at stake, um, the stakes certainly go up. And in this case, we had two performers who were going to be suspended in the air. And typically when I come into a theater to do performer flying, if the system has been installed in the last um, quarter century or so, that system is perfectly capable and um, engineered already to take those loads. This system was, we didn't, we, it was just too old to rely on um, for people's lives at stake to be able to use this existing system. So if you see in the center of the drawing, there's two massive truss structures that um, we actually built on stage and that whole system had to be engineered to support the weight of those two performer performing flying uh, performers and also support the weight of um, additional puppeteers going up on top of the bridges to do other things besides since we have those bridges there. And so that was um, before we even started the show, I, I can remember um, when I first found out that I was going to be working on the show, the very first thing we did was sharpen our pencils and start doing all the engineering calculations on that truss to make sure that what our deflection was was going to be within uh, ranges and we had plenty of design factor, which I, is what often people say is safety factor. I like to use the term design factor because you can never have enough safety, but design, it is designed intrinsically to be safe. <clears throat> and so that was, that was the biggest challenge uh, for that show was just that we weren't able to use the, the existing uh, rigging system in the space. We had to kind of create our own rigging system within that and span across the entire stage. And it's a pretty good sized theater. It's not a tiny theater at all. Um, so that was a really fun and interesting um, challenge. You can take that down, uh, Emily. <clears throat> so um, I think um, one more thing that I wanted to add is that uh, I just wanted to curtail onto something that John said at the beginning of this, because I'd never heard it phrased quite that way. But uh, John, I really, really loved how you said that puppetry is the performance of engineering. And I think a lot of what I do um, as a go-between between, between artists and engineers, because a lot of times I'm firmly in the middle of communicating what the artist wants and then going in communicating with professional engineers, which I am not, I actually like to call myself a pretend engineer um, because I, I know enough to be dangerous and I know enough when to call a real professional um, <laughs> within the context of my work. And so the, uh, I really like that, that phrase, the puppetry is the performance of engineering. That's gonna stick with me, John. Do you, um, do we want to play a, a segment of Sisters Follies before we move on to Jason? Great. So uh, yeah. what you're, what you folks are going to see is um, the end of the show, actually, or nearing the end of the show. Um, it's a clip, it's about six minutes long of Sisters Follies. And I, I think we wanted to ask, Basil might have some voiceover that he want, he want, might want to describe aspects of this, I think. And I don't sure. know if he wants to. <laughs> So oh, you can see it was never forget the opening night of our playhouse. a sort of Halloween-y show. And this is video projection onto you know, the theater masks. Uh, th we had recreations of, of all the major productions that the two sisters did. This was Jeb's Daughter, which was the first production that happened in the neighborhood playhouse. Um, the next production was called The Queen's Enemies. Um, and a little bit of the gag was that 
uh, of the two sisters, the older one, Alice, frequently placed herself as the star. <laughs> and that, there was the conflict, was that the younger sister, who was played by Julie Atlas Muse, was sometimes the secondary character. And so there's a tension that builds between the two characters, which eventually culminates in a fight. Um, but this was a scene called The Queen's Enemies, where there was an effect where it flooded on stage. I don't know how they did it, but that's how we did it. Um, this is the marvelous Julie Atlas Muse. Um, she, there was a piece called The Chiron of Corwin. Uh, and it was, there was a lot of uh, really avant-garde dance that happened at the Neighborhood Playhouse. Martha Graham uh, started performing there in 1921. So Julie is spoofing a lot of early avant-garde dance. Um, they also had a notable piece that the two of them did together, which was called Salut au Monde, which was a, um, uh, an in inspired by Walt Whitman. And as, um, as John had alluded to, Thomas Wilfred, who was a light artist, who invented something called the Clavelux was part of that production, Salut au Monde. And in homage to him, um, there's an actor playing Thomas Wilfred, but the light effects for this show were actually created by Joshua White of the legendary Joshua Light Show, which is a famous psychedelic uh, light show um, from the 60s. Um, Alice and uh, and Irene um, traveled, uh, they left New York, they traveled to Europe, uh, and uh, this is their travel across the sea. Um, uh, and uh, they did a, a few pieces inspired by their travels. Um, this was a piece that was uh, set in Egypt. Um, so it was, you know, this was really like a variety show with lots of numbers. Uh, and human performers, but a lot of puppetry elements in it, and animation of the space, animating, using the, the line sets. There was live music in the pit. It was an extremely ambitious production. Um, this is a piece that was inspired by India. And you can see they're, they're starting their fights. They're really getting tense. And eventually what happens is, this breaks into a big fight of the sisters flying. So here they are flying. The flying was operated by puppeteers. Puppeteers were the ones who were actually pulling the ropes. Um, I think Ed can speak to maybe how that might have been different than having other traditional stage hands operating the, the flying. Yeah, I can say it was, it was a lot easier to be honest. Um, in my usual training, when I train as a flying director, it was really wonderful to work with puppeteers who understood movement and wow. could uh, get it to happen. So here, they have puppet bodies and their heads <laughs> are, their bodies are covered with black. I mean, th this fight was like endless effects like this one after another. It was total Looney Tunes, um, eventually. Irene or, or Alice sucks Irene <laughs> into <laughs> the vacuum cleaner. So there's puppeteers all around dressed in black who are helping do this. Um, and then this is a scene where, um, this is a scene from the Dybbuk, which is one of the most famous uh, pieces done uh, at the neighborhood playhouse by the Lewis and sisters. And those puppets in the air are operated from a marionette bridge above. When we had to install that system that, that, that Ed described, I said, oh, gee. First I said, oh, what a drag. It's taking up so much more space than I had planned. But then I said, oh, gee, how great. We can climb on top of it and we can work marionettes from above, um, which was a bonus that I hadn't planned on. And here they are. Julie was on a spinning a track that she could control her own spin. Joey on the left 
was on a track that the puppeteers controlled his spin. Um, so uh, Julie is a very physical performer and she was able to do, she had a more, a, a rig that allowed her to do more of her own self-controlled, uh, doing somersaults and spinning in, in space. She also had the assist of puppeteers in black on the ground who could help her, um, who could help her control the, her movement. So there were puppeteers also who helped her besides the flying operators in the wings. There were also people who could grab their feet, who could slow them down, who could actually pull them and swing them or keep them from colliding sometimes because they were so close together. They were on two separate tracks but they were meant to play really close together. They had to have distance between them. And so, um, and their costumes were voluminous. So um, puppeteers in black would help actually facilitate that um, right on stage because you couldn't see them. Amazing, amazing Basil and Ed, thank you. It's nice to see the comments from the viewers who are sort of blown away by this show. It's really nice. I thought maybe let, let, we should bring in Jason here um, to talk about his perspective before we go into a general discussion. So Jason, I know that uh, you don't consider yourself a puppeteer, but um, and, and some of this world is new, uh, new to you, but uh, we wanted to get a sense of what, what your perspective is on, on all of these different aspects of it. Uh, engineering and puppetry. Yeah, th thank you, Ed. When I uh, first heard about this panel, uh, I was interested to, to, to look into it, uh, but I told Ed that, you know, I have no experience in puppetry, that I haven't worked on it. So very jealous that you guys have those amazing videos. Um, but uh, the perspective I have is, uh, I remember as a student, and I know a lot of the students I have, you know, you get into engineering because you want to design things, you want to build things. And then uh, as a student, a lot of times you're in these courses where you're teaching fundamental concepts and uh, that concept of creativity gets lost a lot. Uh, and thinking, oh, I, I want to be able to create, but I'm, I'm an engineer, which is, I, I want to create something new and exciting. And a lot of the research you do is, is new and exciting work. But in research, it's a lot of these repetitive work so that a uh, concept of creativity gets lost a lot. Uh, so in a lot of our freshmen and our senior design courses, we try to implement that in our design piece. Uh, and uh, a lot of the students right now are working on design components, but um, definitely very different concepts uh, than what you, we've been seeing in these videos. Uh, I, I think it's really interesting. Basil was showing the, the water and using water as a uh, like storytelling component and that interaction with materials because we teach fluid dynamics we teach about how the water flows and pipes and over uh, airplane wings and it's such a different perspective but the concepts of how water interacts when you have a, a material touching it is still there um, and and your point about over designing is absolutely true, right? If you put any of uh, of faculty, engineering faculty, I think we want to run CFD models to analyze it, and it'll be overkill. Whereas, uh, I, I believe probably your perspective is you're playing with it and seeing how it works, and you know if it's not working the way you want it to, you, know, you adjust, uh, and that's a lot what engineers do. But this concept of over designing uh, definitely can see. Um, Emily, if you could pull up the slides. Uh, so, so when I was thinking about what I would talk about, I was thinking about uh, puppetry and my concept of puppetry is so limited. Uh, if you could pull up the pr presentation, Emily. So I, I, when I think about um, how uh, Puppetry is, I think, uh, Sesame Street. I think about uh, rides in uh, Disneyland. Uh, I don't really think about it from the perspective of rigs and live shows. And there's so many different aspects that you would need to consider when you're thinking about those components. Um, uh, so in this, in the set of slides, I was, I was really thinking about 
how do you how do engineers think about design and what are the commonalities and what's the differences between that and um, uh, uh, puppetry? And so like, these are the things that popped in my head when I think of pu puppetry. And there's so many design components in it. And I think a couple of semester ago, I don't know if it's still active at UConn. Uh, Ed, I don't know if you were the one teaching it, but there was a puppetry and lighting uh, course where they're between fine arts and engineering, there were students from both uh, schools taking courses. Uh, and I think that's that's amazing. And I think the Kernicki Institute is gonna kind of promote some more of these types of courses. So we can get some design concepts and the creativity components that uh, a lot of times is missing. We have always been trying to think about how to add that to courses. Uh, so if you change to the next slide, when we think about uh, any types of design, we always try to figure out on a, uh, what questions do we want to ask? And I think there's a lot of common components, right? If you think about puppets, you need to think about how, uh, what type of materials, uh, what kind of manufacturing processes do you use? How do you control the movements? Um, you probably want to use the puppets over and over. So how do you make sure that they're reliable? Uh, but one big piece that's probably uh, differentiating is that creativity, that storytelling, that aesthetic component, right? When we talk to our students about how do you pick the materials, we talk about, you know, how strong is the material, uh, how's the material interacting with the environment. Uh, it's very seldom that we really think about how nice does it look? What colors do we choose? What's the texture? How's the light bounce off of it? Um, and so that's an aspect of design that um, we typically don't see, but I can imagine that the design process would be quite similar. Uh, and you know, when our when we have our first year students, a lot of times uh, we give them projects. Uh, uh, our first year engineering class um, that we team teach, uh, we do a Mars challenge, right? So they have to generate uh, their own energy, clean their own water. So we give them limited amount of uh, equipment and you know, try to see what they, how they think through the problem. And so a lot of times it's really that challenge that first, first couple of weeks, how do you even begin? And they're, they're stuck with a blank page. How do you design? And so the, you know, I, I try to break it down to the three components that we teach our students. So if you go to the next slide, when we think about where to start, even in our senior design courses, we teach them, right? All you have to do is you have to define the problem. You have to know what the constraints are. And uh, as far as puppetry goes, I, my thought process is, you, you know, what's the range of motion that you want to move this arm? Uh, what are the moving parts? Uh, you know, how much uh, weight is held on it? You know, Ed was talking about the rig design. Um, and if you're flying humans, right? So you want that safety component. All right, we talk about safety factor, like Ed, I think you said uh, design factor, right? So you want to make that very large so you don't have, so you might over design there because you don't want any accidents, um, but over designing, then you have limitations, uh, kind of like the uh, uh, the chains that you were talking about as well. But we also try to implement because a lot of times, a lot of our fundamental courses, we don't talk about the non-engineering constraints, right? The budget, uh, what resource you have to work with, you, you don't have to work with um, and the aesthetics components. and. Uh, uh, what we're working with a lot of our students on now, you know, in our capstone class, where it's a year long project, is uh, trying to get them to break down the project into components, right? So you can either be uh, the different components of the puppet, uh, or maybe choosing the material, uh, how do you move it, the connecting points. And so we usually do this in teams. And I can imagine, you know, uh, none of the work that you guys were working on is probably a one-man team. It's probably multiple multiple uh, groups uh, working together, and that's a big part of engineering. Um, and once you define the problem, you understand what constraints, what are your requirements, then you can start the prototyping, the fun part of it, right? So if you move on to the next slide, uh, a lot of times here is where a lot of over design happens, right? I, I know that uh, some of our students, they go into these CAD programs and they wanna analyze the entire system all the first shot. Uh, but we try to teach them, we talk, we call, we call it unit problems, right? The very fundamental back level calculations, right? You might use a huge assumptions just to get a sense of what kind of materials you might be able to use, 
uh, understand the trends, right? You might not know exact numbers, right? As engineers, a lot of times we're, we're taught to solve and get the exact number and that's our solution but real world problems which puppetry uh, i would consider a real world problem there's no exact answer there's a lot of different types and that creativity components means that there's a lot of different ways you can answer it um so knowing the range and how to approach it in a different way is a good start so starting with a just a general prototype throwing together to see if it works and i don't know if that's the way ed and Basil, you, you guys approach it, uh, probably with a lot of your experience, you don't need to start from scratch uh, like some of our products would. But once you get that first prototype, uh, when we think about engineering problems, we think about an iterative approach. So that's the last slide I have. The next slide. Uh, so when we think about iterative approach, we want to say, all right, I'm going to make these multiple designs. Maybe I'll make multiple puppets. Um, how do I determine whether one works better than another? You have to define uh, usually we try to define as early as we can what these metrics are, right? What are these performance metrics? Maybe it moves in a certain range or it's reliable in a certain way. So you want to define those things. And uh, 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 as engineer, there's a, you have to stop, right? There's an end point because of budget, because of time. So you have to define what a good enough parameter is. And that's usually hard, right? And once you get into a project, uh, you want to keep designing and, and uh, re-engineering until it's better and better, uh, but that's not possible. So when you define the metrics, you want to set those kind of end goals so you can finish a project. Um, and a lot of times we talk about things uh, like uh, design of experiments, which probably not as relevant in uh, puppeteering, but we like talking about, and the, and it's a sim the simple concept is I'm going to choose to use this motor maybe uh for this rig uh and i don't know exactly what size motor so maybe i'll choose this motor i'll choose one size larger and i'll choose one size smaller i'll run some small scale experiments to see which one works the best and then we'll run with that uh, so that's what that top in top right image shows um and uh, a couple things that you know we always challenge our students to do is you know what during the before the design process occurs you try to come up with some kind of plan uh, when I'm running this experiment, uh, the result of it, I'm actually going to use for a design, right? Initially, what we see is a lot of times we'll run experiments and then you're not really sure what you do with it because you haven't really planned for what you do. And so that's what that bottom image, right? So it's having some kind of flow chart that makes sense. So it's really clear once you hit a, you know, a crossroad that I ran this experiment. So now this informs me to take this path. Um, and a lot of problems arise, right? There's a uh, uh, engineers are are guilty of this a lot. Uh, analysis paralysis, right? We want to keep running code. We're not confident. We don't want to build anything until we're 100% sure that the design is the best. Um, and you know, from an engineer's perspective, we have to remember the good enough approach. Uh, so we have to know when to stop. Uh, and then the opposite can be true. Under analyzing, uh, we're uh, you're just running experiments and it's no real plan and you're just running you're, you're trying something out it didn't work you're trying something completely different and it's not really getting closer and closer to any answer uh, at the same time playing is a big part of design right so trying things out and you're learning as you're playing with it uh, we try to to uh, enforce but uh, we kind of do the back the reverse of it in engineering like core courses because we say you follow these specific rules so I, I understand that there's that clash uh, uh, with creativity perspective. Um, and then underestimating how long it will take for things to be designed, uh, designing things in serial, right? One step after another when it could be designed side by side or, or in parallel, uh, because a big piece of design is time, time restriction. Um, and then we always see committing too early, right? Deciding that we're gonna choose this path and not even considering other concepts. So I'm miss, I'm leaving out a whole bunch of uh, design principles like brainstorming and how to work with teams. But um, in general, I guess the thought process I have with puppeteering and engineering is that creativity component adds a pretty high level of complexity uh, that makes the design process really interesting. Um, and, and I like to see a lot of lot more courses at UConn kind of uh, tie the two schools together. Great. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, I think we can all come come back in. I, I was fascinated by the way that sort of everything you listed um, in, from your perspective on engineering, it struck me as like, oh, that that's in, in a different way or in a similar way. Oh, yeah, the puppeteers are thinking about that. And um, I was wondering, uh, listening to you talk, if, if, if one one maybe minor difference between trying to figure out how puppets move or all the amazing things that that Basil and Ed did with Sisters Follies and like thinking about fluid dynamics for making an airplane fly or having water go through a pipe. Um, I wonder if it's about, you know, if those latter things are, are, you know, wanting to achieve functional ends and then with puppetry, you're communicating ideas uh, with with materials and and movement or telling stories uh, with materials and and movement, uh, I don't know. It's it's fascinating. I I also appreciated the fact that the the, the degree to which you were saying that engineering is about um, prototyping or see if it, seeing if things work. And in my experience as a puppeteer, I feel like we make these puppets and then we have to see how they work. You know, it's not always that they do exactly what we want them to do. And there's this process of, to a degree, seeing what the puppets want to do and what the materials want to do. So very exciting. So gentlemen, so I thought uh, now maybe you could ask questions of each other or comment or further go into, uh, Sisters Follies or other aspects that you, that you think of. And also we have some uh, some very interesting questions and comments that, that your presentations have inspired. But maybe first of all, what how do you respond to each other's presentations and the topics that you've each brought up? Maybe going back to Basil who started first. Um. Well, I, 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 I guess since both, uh, uh, both of our, my uh, colleagues here uh, spoke to a, a sort of a thing I threw out was about over design that, um, which is more or, or, or over engineering things. It's interesting because you, as Ed knows, when we did Sisters Follies, I was, I, I am like, oh, let's just hang them from this thing. Like, can't we just hang them? This is this, there's already pipes there. Isn't that enough? <laughs> and if it had been that they were cardboard, um, that would have been okay, maybe, but they were human bodies <laughs> that were hanging. And so indeed it did require an engineer to come in and say, whoa, 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 Basil, you know, <laughs> you, you <laughs> we, that's okay. That's what we're here for. <laughs> seriously. Um, but the, there's, I know that I all, and I, I think that a lot of puppeteers run into this and it happens in the step of prototyping where you prototype something and you frequently, it's a very common thing when you're prototyping, you maybe will build something out of cardboard, you know, because it's, because it's around, because it's easy and you'll use, um, you know, you'll use tape and you'll use coat hangers because there's nothing like a wire coat hanger. You'll, you can't even get that stuff. It's there's, that's the best stuff. But then you, you, you fall in love with the qualities that those things have. And of course, they're not going to last in the long run. They're not there. They, they support you for, to get the idea, the scale, the shape. And immediately once you move into creating the real thing, the most important thing that shows up is weight is that suddenly you build something and it weighs five times as much and you, uh, you, a puppeteer can't possibly carry it. And that's um, when I, I'm, I'm always, now I've fallen into that trap enough that I, um, that I try and be very, very careful with, you know, of course there are materials that you can use that you can find. It's sometimes harder to find them that are lightweight. But sometimes when I do pass the task on to another craftsperson who might not be a puppeteer, it, it I will it'll come back so heavy, so strong in a way so that strong. if it's not if it's not a question of you know a person's life on the line hanging from it, I'm like I know we don't need this. Can't we use 
the coat hanger, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, and it's just, it's an interesting thing. <clears throat> find that I, well, I always, in now that I've been doing this long enough, I'm like, God, we did it again. <laughs> we made something that was, we prototyped something and then we didn't realize how, how heavy it was gonna be or how much use it would get. Um, and, then, and then there's also the reverse that sometimes there is the case where someone will engineer something for me based off of a prototype and it is so overbuilt that it's that it's lost the that the the shimmer of life that we found in the prototype. So it's I mean it can easily go both ways, but it's something that um, it's that dance between the engineering of something um, and the invention of the idea, especially when you're thinking. You know, I I I almost never do drawings. I almost always start with a prototype because I like to. I'm very tactile. I want to th see a three-dimensional thing. Um, so I don't know. I just, just because you guys both spoke to that, I just thought it's sort of a provocative yeah. idea. Don't worry, Basil. We've all gone down that road. <laughs> it's a common, it's a common challenge, I think, for all of us. Um, yeah, it's absolutely one of the biggest things to keep in mind. And I, I just did it when I was, I was talking about we were preparing. Before the pandemic, we were working on a production of um, Yukon was doing um, a production of uh, Little Shop of Horrors and just building. I mean, there it was a really interesting and different take on the design of the puppets from the traditional uh, Venus flytrap puppets. And this last one, we wanted it to be something very, very different. And so I engineered and designed this whole aluminum truss structure and welded it all up and then started to manipulate it. And it was just too heavy. <laughs> You couldn't, it couldn't be an alive puppet with that much weight because uh, if you have one person manipulating, you're limited by the human horsepower. Mm. Humans only, you know, I don't know what is 0.3 horsepower or so. <laughs> That's always a limitation when you're trying to directly manipulate things. Is that still like an, a, at base, an engineering problem? an engineering challenge to get something to move the way you want it, but instead of a kind of practical goal or sometimes a manufacturing goal, the goal is an aesthetic goal. Like is, oh, yeah. is, is, that, is that the difference that we're talking about here between, I don't know what straight engineering is, but, and, and theatrical engineering? I would, I would definitely think so. Um... But it's all, I mean, it, it, just like it happens in iterative design and engineering, like Jason was talking about, it comes down to material choice. And, you know, maybe it, uh, oftentimes what happens is that it just becomes more expensive than you wanted to get what right. you want. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. Basil knows, like, well, yeah, we can do that, but it has to be out of <laughs> aircraft grade 7,000 series aluminum. <laughs> right. And that is not cheap stuff. Um, but it can do, you know, a lot of times the things exist to do the things that we want to do, but it's a matter of time and being able to get them, being able to work those materials. You might not be able to work that material in the way that you are working a different material that wouldn't stand up from a robust standpoint. So it's all a give and take, I think. And, and that's, that's what I see the most important part of my job is, is that that give and take is figuring out <clears throat> how to how to get as close to what the designer, what the artist, what the director, whoever the art artistic envisioner of the project is, how to get as close to what they want as possible while staying safe and while staying, um, you know, definitely gonna, uh, not gonna break in the middle of a performance or anything like that. But you have to, um, I, I think one of the big differences is from at least um, early learning, students learning engineering, undergraduate engineering certainly, um, as opposed to professional engineering, one of the big differences is looking at the aesthetics of it and what it ends up being. I think that's a huge, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, I might be speaking out of turn a little bit, but I've always kind of considered that that's, that's the big next big step for students to overcome is not just creating something that's functional, but creating something that's aesthetic as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's, so I was talking about like the requirements, staying the requirements, the aesthetic piece or making something move the way you want to, or Basil, when you're talk when you're showing like the uh, the water movement. If you can't quant if if I can't quantify what your requirement is in like very strict terms, then it's really hard for me to know even what to design. So I think 
uh, that is a bigger challenge because you, you wanted to move. Maybe you're, you're trying to figure out what your idea is too at the same time. So I don't know if your design requirements uh, slightly change after you see how the prototype works um, or anything like that. That's a good question. What do you think, Basil? Um, <clears throat> I think it uh, depends on the. It depends on what it is. <laughs> yeah, it really depends on what it is, and you know, <clears throat> I, that's why I always, I, I. <laughs> it's funny when I, like as I said, when I look back, I very rarely have drawings of things that I do. I want to work in three dimensions in real scale to see the sort of dramatic effect of something. Um, and, uh, and, and so the, I don't know, the prototyping phase is always the most important mm -hmm. part to me. Uh, there's a good question here that the esteemed Barbara Pollitt asked of, about, um, uh, uh, she, she just is referencing Michael Curry, who's an incredible uh, engineer, amazing, and he has, uh, so just suggesting that he might be a great person to you know have in a panel like this because he's <laughs> one of the things that I know that it's different about Michael Curry than myself is Michael has he's is so masterful with materials and particularly the question of weight and things that are lightweight that frequently are outside of my <laughs> my my um, you know cost range for prototyping. So if I'm I, to make it something out of carbon fiber or to vacuum form something um, is a solution, but it's not when you're in the heat of the moment in downtown Manhattan and you all what you have is some cardboard boxes. Um, uh, but um, but Michael Curry is someone who who I think has really mastered um, these engineering principles, particularly about materials that are strong and lightweight that's like that's a huge thing for puppeteers especially as things get bigger you know as objects get bigger mm -hmm. so we have we're building up quite a few of questions can we knock a few of them out i think the sure go I for it is uh is the first question i see here is from a current mfa student in the puppeteer program at yukon yukon mackenzie doss asks basil what, what type of fabric was used for this show? It has such beautiful movement. I think she was asking about Symphony Fantastique right. yeah. um, in the water. Or no, I think it was actually um, the uh, Rite of Spring. Oh, was it? Okay. But, but both are, both, maybe both, we can think well, the, of. The video, the video that we had was of, um, was of, uh, was of Symphony Fantastique. In, in Symphony Fantastique, because of the water, we, uh, what we use is we use actually, we use synthetic materials because they stand up under the water. The, I, 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 you could, and I, you can put, it's because of the move, it's because of the water that creates the movement, not the fabric actually. You can put a garbage bag underwater and it looks gorgeous. Um, so <laughs> in fact, if you put silk underwater, it's not as beautiful because it kind of clumps together. So I use mostly, completely synthetic materials like a bathing suit would be made out of. Um, but for Rite of Spring, um, and what I use a lot in my work is I use silk. I use a habitat silk um, because it's the lightest weight fabric um, and it's, extre it's an extremely generous material. Um, it gives a lot of movement and it's very lightweight. So that fluidity that you can see with a heavier fabric in the water, um, it, what you're seeing actually is not so much the movement of the fabric, it's the fluid around it, be it the air or the water. And so the fabric just renders that visible. Um, and this, because the water has enough buoyancy to support a heavier fabric and you need a kind of hardy, hardy fabric because over time it's gonna wear down. But silk, when it's in the air, that's the one that is light enough to actually make the air currents become visible. Beautiful. Um, next question is for me, it's uh, from Carol Sterling. Do Yukon Puppet Art students have an opportunity to take elective courses in engineering as part of their undergraduate and graduate degrees? 
that is something we're actually working on. There have been a few things like Jason mentioned, of course, in the past, um, but the Kernicki Institute, which is a new institute at the university, um, is really going to create a lot more opportunities in that. We're actually developing a new major at the university that will be in place um, for the fall of 2022. So not this coming fall, but the following fall, students will be able to actually major in theater engineering where they get a, um, they get a they get an engineering degree, an accredited engineering degree, but in the context of working in in the theater arts or in the engineer in the entertainment industry in general, and so that's really exciting. Um, <clears throat> so they haven't there haven't been a ton of opportunities in the past. There have been a few, but there will be a lot more coming, which is really exciting for me. Um, question for Ed and Basil: Basil, um, how was the electrical effect done? <laughs> it was a scrim and a projector. A video yeah. projector and a scrim downstage of the actors, if I if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there was a scrim in front of the um, in front of the artist the artists, and so it was tricky to light them because you could only light them from the side. But it allowed us to project stuff on top. But that electrical effect is just a projection. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Next question is: Has anyone ever incorporated virtual reality into engineering courses for puppet art students? I don't know. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, something to work on potentially because um, we also have a wonderful partnership at UConn with the Department of Digital Media Design. Right. There's some good opportunities there potentially to integrate puppetry and engineering and digital media. I think it's, yeah, I think what you're saying, Ed, uh, yeah, it's really mm -hmm. true. Like I know that in digital media and design, they're working with that technology and like the way we're doing here, like the way Basil's um connecting with with both of you like may, maybe that could happen it's it's so there's some of that that happens already with digital media design and, and puppet art students but i think what are these questions that carol sterling's asking sort of point to there could be a lot more of that um, this is, this is a great question um, uh, is there an engineer's equivalent to the entertainment industry's phrase, the show must go on? <laughs> I think we use that phrase too. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I can't think of one. <laughs> so that does exist in the engineering world as well, that it has to be, because yeah, our deadlines are real strict deadlines. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> nice. And that question was uh, from another current MFA student, Jennebeth Davidson. Thank you, Jennebeth. Um, I wanted to point out that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ed. Oh, no, uh, I was just gonna do the next question. Do you wanna say something first? Just that I just wanted to point out that Barbara Pollitt, who asked that earlier question, is also a UConn Puppet Arts graduate oh, back in the day. <laughs> um, this one is from Tyler Jacobs for Basil. When you're creating a piece, how much of it is coming up with the original idea that you designed for versus discovering new possibilities when you've got the finished materials and or puppets? Um, most, mostly when I'm creating a piece, it's, it's about the original I, idea because you have to, that's what drives me is there's a lot of times it's either it's, you know, I work with music a lot, so it'll piece of music and I'll listen to the music and it'll suggest it. But a lot of times it'll be the space where I'm working. So Sisters Follies was an example of that because I was invited to, you know, to render homage to a theater. And so I wanted to, I wanted to like maximize the use of the theater and the line sets and the orchestra pit. And I know that whenever I, whenever I go into a space and there is the capacity to, if there's a catwalk or some sort of setup where you can have uh, performers or puppeteers above the performance space, well, that's it. Then you use that. You you would it'd be foolish not to. Um, and that's why actually, for example, in Sisters Follies, I wasn't planning on doing marionette stuff, but because of the necessity, I wasn't planning on doing that because I didn't think I would be able to. I wasn't going to be able to get people up there. Um, but when we had to build that rig that supported people's weight, then I went later on i thought oh i'll use that and that's a that's a those are things that you do discover along the way as part of the process but in general i i almost always start with 
I guess, the concept and the, the, the space as it is first, uh, the experience of the space, what is possible in the space and how to maximize that space. Yeah, I, something that was also very interesting about Sisters Follies and that is basically unheard of is they invited you into the space and they gave you the space for, uh, what, two months? Something like that, yeah. We actually we actually built a lot of the show in the space, which is usually you don't get to do that. You get to, you have to create the show somewhere else and then bring it in. That was we a really unique. Show. We built the whole show in the space. And then once we were done, we had built stuff. We couldn't get it out of the space because there were things that we were built, had built that were too big. <laughs> we had built them on stage. So we just had to, you know, destroy a lot of them. Because they so sad. more. All right, uh, the next question is from Polysonic. It's a good username, I like it. Um, I think a lot of puppeteers use multiple rounds of prototyping instead of technical sketches and math. I wonder how much benefit we could get from learning engineering skills. Do you have recommendations for how very mathematically unskilled artists could gain basic knowledge? Um, absolutely, I do. That's generally what I teach in my curriculum uh, to a large extent. It's what I call pretengineering instead of engineering. It's, it's knowing enough about the basics and really understanding the general rules of thumb of engineering to allow you to get most of the way there and then know when you need to call someone um, a professional engineer. And so it's actually what I'm trying, one of the things that I try to do with my program, um, the technical direction MFA program here at UConn, I invite a lot of puppet arts students. Uh, for example, Mackenzie and Jenna Beth um, have both taken some of my technical direction classes, which very, very heavily flirt with engineering principles. And I, I and when I talk to students about coming into those classes, um, th there's not really a math barrier of entry for them. I'm able to work, I've been able to work around wherever a student is coming from to be able to get them to where uh, they need to be. And I think it really can help depending on what type of puppetry you're interested in doing um, because structure is such a fundamental and important part of, of creating um, physical puppets. And one of the biggest things that I've been developing and working on more is, is how to create lightweight puppets <laughs> and, you, and finding materials that work well for doing that sort of thing is something that's near and dear to my heart that I've been working on a lot lately and I plan to work on a lot more in the future. I wondered if Jason had a response to that question about how very mathematically unskilled artists could gain basic knowledge. Yeah, I think what Ed is saying is actually very valuable. I think one of the, problems uh, that we have is sometimes we try to dump too much engineering into our classes and then you give a pretty fundamental problem that you can solve with arithmetic and the students want to use like a, a computer model you know, like you're, you're over complicating things um, and like understanding the basic concepts if you're a man if you're within the magnitude most likely it's good enough to start if if you don't need it to be super precise so like uh, Ed you were talking about like rig design that's mainly statics right yep which is mainly adding and subtracting and you're as long as you know how to draw the arrows pointing in the right direction mm -hmm. you're probably fine so uh you don't necessarily need to have you know high level of math to get in it's a relatively low barrier to entry to just start at least yeah you can even solve some of the problems geograph or uh yeah you can solve them without any math whatsoever right right and it sort of leads into Jennebeth's question, are there some basic engineering concepts every puppeteer should know? Maybe that's something that you could all uh, respond to, perhaps. What do you think, Basil? <laughs> you go first. <laughs> oh, gosh, I don't know. I can't, I mean, I don't come from a, uh, you know. Well, let, let, me, let me change the question a little bit. If you were hiring, um, if you were hiring a new puppet, um, puppeteer fabricator for your company, for Tandemotter, and you could pick them to have whatever skills you wanted in the world. Are there any engineering concepts that you would want them to have to better create your vision? I would think uh, materials would be the biggest one. Materials, I mean, I'm also, I, as I, Materials, no, you know, a familiarity with with different materials. I also, I feel like I, um, I, I, I wish that I had more inter, more digital skills in terms of creating, um, uh, you know, schematics and drawings. 
um, that are that are accurate as opposed to the cocktail napkin sketches that I some if I ever do anything it's like a you know a cocktail napkin sketch so I wish that I did have more um, skills with digital tools in terms of like CAD programs and stuff that actually allow me to really accurately communicate something to somebody else um, and I don't know a lot of people have those I I I suffer from not having them and so I need to have people help me with those things. I happen to know several uh, soon to graduate puppetry students <laughs> at the University of Connecticut who can help you with that. <laughs> well, I don't need to learn it. Awesome. <laughs> no, you don't. Just hire someone who knows it. <laughs> You're famous now. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Jason, did you ever thought about basic engineering concepts every puppeteer could know or should know? So again, I'm coming from a layman's perspective, but probably like that rig Right. So understanding how rigs work and how much weight you can put on it probably sounds like it, it could be valuable or like um, uh, basic robotics. If you do any kind of robotic or like know how to uh, make fluid motions, what what motors to use that that might be useful, maybe mechatronics or something like along those lines. I see there was a question about 3D printing. I, I don't know if you guys have used any 3D printing in puppets. I feel like that, that'd be very interesting. Yeah, we do. We do a fair amount of it. Um, I wouldn't say we, I don't know. Um, it is, I think it's becoming more and more common, but it's also, it's challenging um, because when you're creating puppets, and, and again, this is coming from a layman. I'm not, I, I have to be upfront. I'm not a puppeteer. I'm just puppet adjacent. But from the impression that I get from students, when you're creating a puppet, when you're sculpting like a puppet head or something, that experience is very different from creating it digitally in a computer. So one thing that I have seen a lot of is creating something physically and then scanning it or recreating it digitally to mass produce something. I know um, we had a student who did a, um, a production a few years ago who, and he mass produced, I, I don't know, it was like a hundred or something um, heads for his puppets that were all based off of a sculpt he did of his own face. Um, and he 3D printed them all, and he wouldn't. It would have taken far too long right. um, if for the time allowable to do it in another way. So that technology has certainly started to um, permeate that culture. Um, I think it's still a little bit early on because it hasn't become commonplace enough yet. Um, and I know here at the university, some some of the technology we haven't had access to prior to now. We actually are just opening a new production facility at the university um, in the theater department, so we have a lot more advanced machinery that we never had access to before. So I'm really excited. Um, yes, uh, I was struggling to remember. Thank you, Bart. The name of the production was El Beto by Caleb Martinez um, yeah. that he 3D printed all those heads. Um, Basil, Basil, do you have you used 3D printing at all? Not, not myself. I mean, I have used some things that have been like we, you know, there's a piece that's created and then we replicate it by scanning it. Right. So that's that's happened. But I, 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 because as I admitted to, I don't have the digital skills, so I can't I, I can't create in that medium. To create something, I have to do it, you know, in an analog way. And then there has been some cases where we'll rebuild a puppet part that we made, like that we sculpted, and we're repeating it, and then we'll three D print it, we'll scan it, and. and and recreate it in a may and even in a harder material. Mm, I guess I guess I want to think that that the engineering aspect of puppetry exists on all the different levels that we wherever we enter into it, whether it's with cardboard and a coat hanger, or with newspaper or paper mache, or if it's with carbon uh, materials like like Michael Curry uses, or if we're thinking about three D printing. I don't know, to, in, in a way I want to think it's sort of different ways of thinking about engineering and some of us are actually using engineering principles, but we might not be thinking about it or we might not be using math. And I was thinking that, you know, to a certain extent with, with puppetry, it's like, like Ed was asking, what do you, what, uh, you know, what do you want from a puppeteer in terms of engineering? And I was thinking, well, you want, I, I, someone who knows how to dance or someone who knows how to make materials dance in a way like because dance is in some ways the closest art form to puppetry but 
I don't know. I, I'm fascinated by the way we're going back and <clears throat> forth here. It's um, getting to be the the end of our time here. So I wonder if we want to. Um, uh, we have one more good question. Can we do one more good question? Take it away. All right. So from, uh, again, Mackenzie Doss, who's a current MFA student in the puppetry program here at UConn. <clears throat> so, many, so many puppeteers are working from limited budgets or have limited resources. Productions with greater engineering aspects are very appealing to design, but what advice do you have for puppeteers to pursue more technical avenues? And that's a really good question. And it's a, it's a good point that a lot of the things that we're talking about often also come with the added cost and expense. And I think where, um, in my opinion anyway, where it comes helpful is the knowledge of materials and how to use them and so that you can find the lesser costly alternatives to things um, or pick your, pick your spots instead of saying a whole thing needs to be made one way, say, well, this, this one part of this mechanism or joint that's gonna have a lot of wear on it, we're gonna make that one piece out of aluminum and then everything else can just be made out of wood because it's inexpensive and it's easy to mold it the way that you want it to be. Or um, you just have one piece. So I, I think it's to an extent to pick your poison a little bit, um, but it's a it's a fair point that a lot of the things that we've been discussing are all, also have a cost entry barrier. <clears throat> but one thing I would say to that too is that just it, it isn't there is no shame in in uh, or there it's not actually using the you know the basic engineering principles of leverage or a fulcrum or things or rotation to repurpose something that actually is commercially or you know industrially created that you could buy at Bed Bath and Beyond and you it's made for one thing and then you repurpose it for something else and it has the proper you know gear or leverage or you know to make you know like a uh, you know of of I use I mean, I use umbrellas a lot because umbrellas are marvelously engineered to be lightweight, to have fantastic movement. And I don't need to start at square one building engineering an umbrella. I can repurpose it. And I still feel like I'm using these engineering principles by using something that already exists and just reinventing it. So I'm still, I'm still working with those principles that have to do with you know, something collapsing, something, something that's, uh, uh, you know, that has a spring, um, those kind of things. Um, I'm, I'm still using those principles, even if I didn't start, you know, with the raw materials and the raw math that's involved in it. I'm still using those engineering pr principles. And that's a way to get around, you know, some of the costs of starting at the, at that very basic beginning level. Well, that's a I would say suggestion. I would say, Mackenzie, you're, if you're a student, you have an advantage because you have access to maker spaces on campus if you want to use any of them. And if you want to reach out to folks in the engineering department, and I'm sure there'll be some students who'll be, the students are always interested in working on hands-on projects. So you might be able to get some free labor there and uh, tap into those resources as well. So uh, don't, don't forget that you're, as a student, you do have some resources available to you. Absolutely. I wanted to thank all three of you for this amazing discussion. I, there could be like part two and part three and part four of this discussion because so many wonderful ideas have come up and so many different aspects. I, I deeply appreciate the way you've all been able to look at <clears throat> this, the situation of puppetry and engineering, um, engineering and puppetry and, and to help us think about all of these uh, possibilities. Uh, technology and engineering and, and puppetry has, has developed in some ways. Um, Jason mentioned maker spaces that I, I know like our grad assistant Felicia Cooper has been doing a lot of work there. I know that uh, Will Smith and Rob Cutler, our students here have also been working in those spaces and learning all sorts of new technologies. So, um, Thank you, Basil. Basil's film, Symphony Fantastique. I think we've posted connections to how people can see it. Um, 
Ed is doing amazing things at the dramatic arts department and being so wonderful working with puppet art students and help um, among others. I, I've, I love uh, being in a room with Ed and students and noticing how attentive he is and, and such a good listener and, and respondent to what students are doing. And Jason, it's a great pleasure to, to, to meet you. And I hope that we can continue to, to connect with you and learn more about your work. Um, also want to thank uh, Emily Wicks, who's been, as you can tell from this event, making things happen. Also, um, I'm reminded by Emily that, that the Ballard Institute is, is making all our current programming free and accessible online. So people will be able to see this on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. Um, and if you'd like to make a contribution, uh, there's technology that you can make a contribution to support all this work. Uh, I think uh, Emily's posting it on the, the Facebook chat, but um, there's a URL to make contributions. And uh, we're gonna do more puppet forums in the spring. Uh, really excited about hearing more about Basil's work, his new projects that he's working on in London and Ed's work and Jason's work. Thank you very much for, for taking part in this event, everybody who's watching, including my friend, Jamie Leo. Um, good, okay, thank you, everybody. We'll thank see you. you later. Bye, thank you.